Welcome everyone to this afternoon session. So uh, we will have now the lecture by Philippe Joachim about the theory of neutrino masses and mixing. Uh, so, well, please, Philippe, whenever you want to start. Okay, so thank you very much. First of all, I would like obviously to thank uh, my friends and uh, also collaborators from Valencia for inviting me to give uh, these uh, talks which actually I realized that uh, 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 only a few days ago that these are two lectures, not one, because from the, uh, uh, at the beginning it was supposed to be just one last year, but then I was promoted to two because I complained. And <laughs> but this, was, this was actually my fault. But anyways, uh, so this is the outline of, uh, of my uh, lectures. So I will start by giving... Uh, by saying something about neutrinos in the standard model. Uh, actually, there is not much to say uh, about this uh, when the lectures are about neutrino masses and mixings, and you know already uh, why it's because neutrinos are uh, actually massless in the standard model. But anyways, I would just uh, remind you some things that probably you may have seen already during uh, Andrew's uh, lectures. Then I will uh, tell you how to construct uh, the most general uh, neutrino mass terms. And uh, after that, we will look at the standard model and the, uh, to the, uh, at the problem of neutrino masses from uh, an effective uh, point of view. This is actually my favorite way to look at neutrino masses because it's quite model, model independent. Then I will say some words be, uh, about lepton mixing also because you you will probably need uh, some basic material for the uh, next le uh, next lectures that uh, uh, may come, like for instance the ones from neutrino oscillation uh, on uh, neutrino oscillations experiments. Then I will discuss some three-level uh, realizations of the effective neutrino masses, also some radiative neutrino mass mechanisms. And uh, also some hybrid examples, uh, because uh, there are uh, act uh, actually there are very interesting frameworks in the literature where you actually mix several kinds of uh, uh, three level and radiative uh, neutrino mass um, uh, mechanisms uh, in the same, let's say, in the same model. Then, if I have time uh, on uh, Monday, uh, I will talk about a bit ab about family symmetries, which is uh, somehow independent uh, from the problem of neutrino masses, but which at some point we have to address if we want to say something, uh, if you want to try to explain what neutrino oscillation experiments have been measuring regarding the lepton mixing angles and also neutrino masses. And uh, I will give a few examples of flavor symmetry models. Here, probably, I will not be too exhaustive, uh, also because I don't have time, because there are actually hundreds of models that people have been uh, working on in the last in the last decades. So, some disclaimers about these talks. First, these two lectures are not supposed to be an exhaustive discussion on neutrino mass and mixing models, because as I just told you, there are uh, hundreds of models and uh, with uh, several symmetries, uh, several extra particles, several uh, either being at three level uh, um, realizations of neutrino masses or radiative generalizations of uh, neutrino masses. So I will not be at all exhaustive uh, in this in this thing, there will also not be much phenomenology because uh, you will have lectures uh, on lepton flavor violation. I think one lecture uh, by Sasha Davidson on Monday, if I'm not wrong, um, by Sasha Davidson, and she will uh, probably discuss um, many things that uh, may actually be connected with neutrino masses and mixings, but which are a consequence of uh, neutrino masses. Then uh, the reference list that the references which will, you will see uh, during the slides will not be exhaustive also and sometimes I will not be totally fair in the sense that I tried sometimes 
to give to to refer to texts which are more pedagogical instead of uh, uh, putting the reference of the 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 original original papers as you will see uh, everything that i will tell you about nothing is new so people have have worked on the subjects i will tell you about for years so it will be like a mess to put all the references and this since this is a school i think it's important to give to to the students some key references such that if they want to learn more about the details they can go there and uh, uh, study um, what i will not have time to do to, to do here now I've decided, uh, um, and this is the fault of uh, Avelino, because he told me that uh, this tool, uh, the BB Collab, uh, allows us to do some quizzes. So I've decided to uh, do uh, some questions, but these questions are very simple. Okay, sometimes they are uh, embarrassingly simple, uh, but since I, since there may be some experimental uh, uh, students that are more directed to experimental uh, particle physics or also some master students so i think that um, these questions uh, may be interesting although simple for the others i hope that at least they uh, prevent you from uh, uh, sleeping or they may keep you uh, awake during the, the lectures okay so some uh, bibliography there are many excellent books on neutrino physics. I put uh, these ones here. I think probably I missed some, but uh, these are my uh, favorite ones. Of course, there are a couple of ones which are my favorite ones, but I will not tell you which ones are, are they. So in these books, you mainly uh, find the basic material uh, about neutrino physics. There is a lot of material that I will not tell you about here. Of course, there is also a lot of material that you have been uh, uh, have been this uh, being are being discussed in other lectures and will be discussed in other lectures in the in next week. But the interesting thing is, is that some of these books actually uh, also touch the part of uh, model building and uh, which is the, uh, i would say uh, a very important part for, for for my lectures although they are not none of these books uh, is also exhaustive in the in the um, in the subject as for instance the one of flavor symmetries and how to try to explain the neutrino mixing and mass patterns for that i give you here uh, a list of uh, also excellent reviews and lecture notes um, at some point, I will produce a PDF of these of these uh, slides, and if everything goes okay, you can directly click on the on the links, and you may you may go you go directly to to the reference. Okay, so having said these uh, initial considerations, let me start from the beginning okay don't be afraid i'm not going to tell you the whole story about the neutrino but i'm i just brought this uh, poly letter that he wrote to the dear radioactive and, uh, ladies and gentlemen to actually illustrate the fact that uh, neutrinos proposal by by poly in 1930 was something very bold okay nowadays is something that we do in a regular basis every day if you go to the archive actually you have everyday papers dozens of papers maybe even more not every day but for sure in the last in the last years where people uh, uh, propose um, new particles and this is quite natural for Pauli by that time this is this was not natural he had problems uh, of proposing something that he knew that uh, it was going to be very difficult to to detect okay at the beginning you know he called uh, he called the, this particle the neutron and this was a way out to save uh, things that he considered to be sacred like the um, the, pr the principle of conservation of energy so you see this this is quite revolutionary because when you have remember that by that time there were these uh, 
huge figures in huge people in physics, the barons of, of physics, and uh, try uh, come uh, um, doing a suggestion like this. Um, it was very bold because this was something that was considered uh, very speculative. But anyways, Pauli did it and he was right. And the neutron, as he called it, but now no this particle uh, as the neutrino was uh, was born. And this was the beginning. Uh, this is the basis for Fermi to construct the first uh, theory of uh, beta decays. And I brought the uh, papers, uh, Fermi's paper here, because as you can see here in, in at some point, he says that in figure one, which is this figure, uh, the end of the uh, distribution curve of the electron energy in, in beta decay uh, is represented for uh, the neutrino mass equal to zero for small neutrino mass and for a large neutrino mass. Then he says that the, the experimental curve uh, or the th uh, resembles the most with the theoretical one when we consider mu equal to zero, so neutrino mass equal to zero. So that we conclude that the neutrino mass is equal to zero, or in any case, small when compared with the mass of the electron. From now on, we will consider the neutrino mass equal to zero. Similar, similar uh, considerations were also made by Perrin in, 19, uh, in a paper of 1933 related with, uh, with also with beta decays. So you see the idea, the general idea that neutrinos are massless actually gained uh, momentum uh, because of that. I mean, you could not uh, see any indication of um, massive neutrinos. So another interesting thing about this uh, Fermi paper, which is just a curiosity, is that this paper was originally rejected by the editor uh, of Nature. And the reason was, was that it, was, uh, it contained uh, speculations which are too remote from reality to be of the interest to the reader. So this uh, teach us a lesson, and especially for you, for the young people, is that don't be very upset if in the future you get a paper rejected by nature. This doesn't mean that you will not win a Nobel, a Nobel Prize, okay? So uh, don't be very upset with that. Okay, so history went on, and this was actually the first description of weak interactions. So then uh, it was uh, during the uh, in the 70s uh, um, Glashow, Weinberg and Salam came up with a with a with a standard model which you have already seen in Andrew's lectures that it is actually a, a very remarkable uh, theory based on very powerful mathematical principles of uh, gauge symmetry uh, but we know today that uh, the standard model is incomplete. And why is the standard model uh, incomplete? There are some uh, theoretical, some issues with the standard model that for uh, th uh, theorists are actually not very elegant. And I suppose that you have seen them in, in Andrew's lectures, like uh, the hierarchy problem, the flavor problem, the QCD problem, there are many problems. But these problems are um, problems which are, let's say, aesthetical. Okay. When I mean that the standard model is incomplete, is that incomplete because of experimental uh, evidence? Okay. There are mainly three uh, experimental facts. Which tells us, uh, which tell us that the standard model is uh, incomplete. So, the first one, and uh, of course uh, there is no relevant order uh, in this. The first one is neutrino oscillations. So we have observed neutrino oscillations. You will learn a lot about this in Michele Maltoni's lectures uh, on Monday and Tuesday, I believe. The crucial point here is that neutrino oscillations require that uh, neutrinos are massive and that they mix. And this is not possible in the standard model. Okay? In the standard model, neutrinos are uh, strictly massive, massless. Uh, another experimental fact is dark matter. 
there is in the standard model there is uh, no candidate for dark matter and this is quite embarrassing because dark matter uh, is uh, uh, around 85 percent of the matter of the universe so you see if if you have a theory that doesn't explain this you although it's very successful explain many other things i mean you really need to find a way to extend this theory to include this kind of uh, experimental observation and last but not least the baryon asymmetry of the universe so the standard model has the ingredients to um, explain why there is an excess of matter over antimatter but that excess is not uh, when you actually compute it, it the number does not uh, agree with uh, with data okay and you have probably also seen in during this the andrews lecture that this has um, to do with the problem of not having enough cp violation in the standard model and also because of the phase transition it's not strong enough the phase transition you need to explain the for electroweak baryogenesis to occur and this is a consequence also uh, of the value of the higgs mass that we have that the lhc has uh, has come up with so you see when you look at these uh, three uh, experimental facts you think okay that maybe uh, i can find a solution for neutrino oscillations then one solution for the dark matter problem and another solution for the baryon asymmetry of the universe the exciting thing is that there are ways to extend the standard model such that these three problems have a common solution and uh, uh, the even more exciting things is that these roots can have may have to do with uh, the way neutrinos uh, become massive okay i don't know if i will have time uh, during the second lecture to cover something about this but there are actually models in which you can produce uh, masses for neutrinos and at the same time you have a dark matter candidate and also you can um, let's say uh, also produce the baryon asymmetry uh, of the universe through a different mechanism from the one that uh, um, you have probably seen in the standard model which is electroweak baryogenesis okay so uh, just one one slide about the the standard model mainly to set some notation so in the standard model we have these particle contents we have the quarks the charge leptons the neutrinos the gauge bosons and the higgs boson so in this chart you basically have inside each rectangle the particles which uh, feel the strong interaction the electromagnetic interaction and the heat the weak interaction so the higgs is here in the middle because okay so i should okay the the higgs is uh, here in the middle because it actually plays a crucial role in breaking the electroweak uh, symmetry okay so this this uh, chart actually shows you the particle content but it doesn't show you how these particles are distributed in the mathematical uh, legals that let's say the mathematical structure of the standard model so the left-handed uh, quarks are organized in uh, three su2 doublets remember the standard model gauge group is su uh, su3 cross su2 cross u1 here i will be, uh, be focused on the su2 cross su1 uh, part so the quark doublets are or, uh, the quarks uh, the left-handed particles are organized in doublets and the right-handed uh, uh, quarks in singlets of uh, su2 so you see that in the standard model left-handed and right-handed particles are not treated in the same way and this is crucial because as you know the standard model is a chiral theory and this is very important for the whole structure uh, and for also uh, the compatibility with uh, with experiment as for the leptons we have also the left-handed uh, lepton doublets which contain neutrinos uh, and uh, charged leptons there are also three families we have the right-handed charge leptons uh, in also in singlets 
But of course, as you know, there are no right-handed neutrinos in the standard model. So you may ask why weren't right-handed neutrino fields included in the standard model? Well, I don't know, but for sure it was because it was uh, a general idea in the community that neutrinos are ma were massless. It would be very easy to just uh, consider the right-handed neutrinos also in the, um, in the standard model and just construct a, a Dirac mass term also for, for the neutrinos. However, since neutrinos were thought to be massless, people uh, also find it uh, somehow inter uh, interesting that there, were, uh, there wouldn't be, the reason was because there were no right-handed neutrino fields in the, in the standard model. So how do uh, these uh, charged leptons and quarks acquire their mass? Through the coupling of the Higgs uh, with the Higgs boson. So this is the Higgs uh, doublet, okay? You couple the charge, le the left-handed doublet with the, uh, the right-handed singlets with the direct coupling with the Higgs. This is the charge left and you call a coupling matrix. You do the same for the up quarks and for the down quarks. Now, the question is, okay, so the standard model is so predictive, does it say anything or something about these uh, numbers here? This is the first question that usually uh, master students ask me when I present this, uh, this Yukawa couplings is that, okay, so you are saying that the standard model is so nice, but for sure it, 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 it tells us also something about these numbers, right? And the answer is no. The standard model is completely blind uh, with respect of, uh, to, these, to these numbers here. You can put here whatever you want. These matrices are general uh, three by three uh, complex matrices. And you have to uh, do something else if you want to start trying to explain the masses that you have here in, the, in, the, in this chart, the masses of the particles, and also their mixing angles for instance, uh, to explain the CKM matrix that you may have seen also in, the, in Andrew's lectures. So after the electroweak symmetry is uh, broken and the Higgs acquires the neutral component of the Higgs stuff that acquires the web, you generate the mass matrices. And again, these mass matrices are arbitrary and here uh, the Yukawa couplings are missing, okay? Well, so now, Neutrino masses in the standard model. So uh, in the standard model, neutrinos, as I said, cannot be massive because there are no right-handed neutrinos. But the question now is, can we actually construct with the fields that we have available, a mass term for the neutrino? And this is my first poll. Let's say if I manage to do this. So this is, Question one, A. Okay, Valentina, so maybe you let me know afterwards if you if everything is working or not. So start, can you see it? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so I think it's working. I think you have a question too. Someone raised their hand. Could it be? But I cannot see the question. Let me see. One moment. In the chat. No, I just saw a, a raised hand. But. Okay, so I think this stabilized. No. Still people voting. Okay, so maybe I stop it. Okay. So, uh, can you see the answer? No. No. Okay, so something went wrong, but 
I can tell you that it was, for my surprise, it was very balanced. Okay, so it was something like uh, 15 people uh, option A, uh, 25 people option B, and 15 people uh, option C. So actually, uh, most of the people were a bit indecised, but the answer is yes, okay? Remember, the question is, can we construct a neutrino mass term with new else only? But I'm not saying that they should respect the gauge symmetry of the standard model, okay? That's another question. That's another, that's another subject. So what I was asking is that if you only have uh, new, uh, neutral left-handed fields, can you construct a neutrino mass term for uh, a neutrino mass term? The answer is yes. So let's say, uh, let's see why. For that, let's look at the Dirac uh, mass term. And remember that this is just new bar new. If you decompose the uh, the, the neutrino, the Dirac field into its, into its uh, left-handed and right-handed component, you have new L bar new R plus new R bar new L, and this is usually written in, in this way. Now, uh, when you construct a new, uh, any mass term or any term in, 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 the, in the Lagrangian, there is a basic and obvious requirement that you must uh, fulfill, which is Lorentz invariance. And if you remember from your uh, very introductory quantum field theory courses, when you do uh, such a kind of Lorentz, a space-time Lorentz transformation like x prime equal to lambda x, uh, your uh, the solutions of the Dirac uh, equation transform in this way. So this s lambda is the spinner transformation uh, associated to this lambda, to this lambda. Um, lambda transformation. Okay, so you can. Uh, this you have seen for sure, then you proved that the Dirac joint of the field transforms with the inverse of the spinner transformation. And you may now apply the same thing to the left-handed uh, neutrino field. So if you have a new L uh, under the Lorentz transformation, new L will transform with the spinner transformation, new L X, and new L bar will transform with the inverse of the uh, spinner transformation. So the point is that you see that when you construct a, a mass term, you need a, a left-handed field, you need a right-handed field, and the bilinear that you construct must be, uh, must be uh, invariant uh, with the Lorentz transformation. So this means that one of the sides of the bilinear must transform with S minus one and the other one with S. So basically what you what we need is some function or some transformation of new L which transforms under the Lorentz transformation in the same way as new L transform but it must be right-handed okay and the answer for that is that the conjugate of new L fulfills these requirements okay why because the conjugate of new L is, is actually right-handed. If you apply the left-handed projector to new L conjugate, it's equal to zero. And this automatically means that if you apply PR to this will be equal to new L conjugate because PL plus PR is equal to one, okay? Also, you can prove, and this you maybe have to, I forgot to tell you something, but when you see this notebook here is that you can um, easily uh, by just using simple uh, simple algebra you can uh, prove these these results okay so you can also uh, prove that new l conjugate transforms as new l under lorentz transformations and the new l conjugate bar transforms with the inverse of the lorentz transformation so the mass term we are looking for is m new l conjugate bar new l so right-handed left-handed and invariant under lorentz transformation if you now uh, define the field which is the sum of new l plus new l conjugate you can actually write this mass term in the usual way but this is a majorana mass term 
you heard already about this in uh, during Andrea, uh, Andrea's talk about the neutrinos, so will be the decay. And such a field is a Majorana field, which obeys the Majorana condition, which means that if nu is equal to nu L conjugate plus nu L, this means that nu is equal to nu conjugate. So neutrinos can be their own antiparticles. Okay. So the main difference between Dirac and Majorana is that in a Dirac field, the left-handed and the right-handed components are independent. Components are written in Portuguese. Uh, components are independent. And for the Majorana field, they are not independent because the Majorana field is nu L plus nu L conjugate. And here you see that the left-handed and the right-handed components are not independent. Okay. There is a lot of things to, to, to say about all these uh, things of uh, differences between Dirac and Majorana neutrinos at the fundamental level. Uh, many interesting things which come up when you, when you actually quantize these fields. And I recommend you to, uh, to read the first chapters of uh, Carlo Giunti's uh, book, because there are many details and I think it's very well explained there. Okay, so the problem of this uh, Majorana uh, neutrino mass is that it's not invariant under the standard model gauge symmetry. And a very simple way to, to see that is that neutrinos are in doublets, which have hypercharge minus one. And this term here is, uh, uh, is not invariant under U1 uh, hypercharge. Also, you could do it, you could reach the same conclusion taking into account that since this is new l new l and new l's are in a doublet this transforms as a triplet okay so uh you cannot uh, actually write this mass term uh at the beginning when you are uh, constructing the standard model so what can we conclude the Majorana mass term is not invariant under the standard model gauge group and there are no right-handed neutrino fields in the standard model. Okay, so this leads me to my next question. Does this mean, or with this information I gave you so far, can we say that neutrinos are strictly massless in the standard model? So let me do the poll here. So question two. Uh, no, it's not appearing. A, B, C. No, it's not working. Yeah, I think okay. it, it was visible. Okay, now it disappeared. Okay, A, B. And I know what I did wrong in the first one. It's because I okay. stopped it. I, I didn't. OK, so now you see it, right? Yes, yes. So some people have no idea. OK, so maybe I show now the response. Can you see the, the answers? Uh, I do, yeah. OK, so uh, people are, ba are balanced between A and B. OK, some say yes, definitely. Others say not yet, still have to check a couple of things. So the right answer is is not yet, still have to check a couple of things. Why? Because up to now, what we have shown is that neutrinos are massless in the standard model at the classical level, okay? So we have to worry about things like, what about uh, quantum corrections? Now here, there is uh, an interesting uh, fact is that in the standard model, there is an accidental U1 symmetry under which leptons, and in particular neutrinos, transform in this way. Okay, 
So this is usually called a lepton number. And this lepton number symmetry is preserved even after electroweak uh, symmetry breaking. The problem is that the Majorana mass term is not invariant under this symmetry, okay? If you don't see it right, uh, right away, I mean, remember that new L conjugate, you have to do the conjugate, and then with the bar, you have to do the dagger, so the charge is the same as new L. So if lepton number is one, this is actually delta L equal two. Uh, okay, just to, to remind you that, uh, uh, this notation is for lepton, and then sometimes I will use also L for, for lepton number. So the point is that after you break the, uh, after you break the electroweak uh, symmetry, uh, you, uh, you still have in the standard model this, um, this lepton number uh, symmetry. So that means that if you don't have a source of lepton number uh, violation, then you cannot uh, um, produce or you cannot generate uh, a mass term, a Majorana mass term for neutrinos at all orders in perturbation theory. So if, it, if you cannot do this and if you don't have right ended neutrinos, then, and also there are other issues like, uh, so you should check if there are non perturbative effects in the standard model that could generate this these masses, but even those uh, actually conserve B minus L that for the for the matter of uh, neutrino masses is the same as a lepton number. So you can also uh, argue that not even with non perturbative effects, you can generate neutrino masses. And you could also say, okay, what about gravity? But that's another story. The only thing that we could say is that if we just uh try to look for effective neutrino mass operators and you say that the scale of new physics is the Planck scale which is the one the typical scale of, of gravity then neutrino masses would be too small so i would say that neutrinos are strictly uh, massless in the standard model but we know that neutrinos have mass i mean there was even a nobel prize uh, for the discovery of neutrino oscillations in uh, 2015. so you see, neutrino oscillation is something that the students uh, um, usually say, okay, but this is so simple that even uh, with the introductory course in quantum mechanics, you can actually write down in 10 minutes or even less the, uh, prob the oscillation probability between nu alpha and nu beta in the, in the most simple case of uh, two neutrino scenarios. And they say, but how can this lead to a Nobel Prize? Well, actually, this is how things are supposed to be, right? The most beautiful ideas are the ones that uh, um, make some and cause some uh, revolutions in, in science. So you see, although this is introductory quantum mechanics, it really opens a window to uh, physics uh, beyond, beyond the standard model. So having said this, let me, and let me now try to be a bit more systematic and try to um, write down the most general neutrino mass terms without uh, caring about standard model gauge invariant, uh, gauge invariance. So I just I will just consider that I have some left-handed fields, which for convenience I will consider that, that I have three because these are the ones that we have in the standard model. And we have already seen with these left-handed fields, we can construct the Majorana mass term in this way. So the difference between the, this, uh, my, uh, this mass term and uh, the one that I've showed you previously is that now I have included flavor here, okay? So in uh, flavor space, the mass term is not a number, but it's a three by three matrix. And because of the nature of this mass term, we can actually show that this is a complex uh, uh, symmetric matrix, okay? And this has to do with Fermi-Dirac statistics. And let me also consider that I have NR right-handed uh, neutral fields, call them neutrinos, okay? Some people don't like to call them neutrinos because neutrinos are actually those of the, of the standard model, but um, let me call them right-handed neutrinos. So 
once you introduce these right-handed neutrinos, you, because they are also neutral particles, you can also you can do exactly the same thing that you did for the left-handed ones. So you can write a Majorana mass term for the right-handed neutrinos, and again you will have uh, uh, this MR, which is the Majorana, the right-handed neutrino um, mass, and they are basically the same. You just have to change the chiralities, and of course the the mass matrix is different. Now, since you have left-handed and right-handed fields, of course, you can write a Dirac mass term. And this is very similar to the ones that you write for the charged leptons and for the quarks. Now, this matrix here is, this mass matrix is a general complex matrix. So the most general Dirac Majorana mass term is the sum of these three uh, terms, okay? Left-handed Majorana, right-handed Majorana, and Dirac. Okay, so now let me do the following. Let me write down uh, a, vec a column vector in flavor space where I put the left-handed field combinations. So I put nu L and nu R conjugate that you already know that transforms as left-handed field. So these nu L are the three uh, new Ls from, let's say, the standard model. And these new R conjugate are the NR fields, right-handed fields that I've, I have uh, introduced. So now my Dirac Majorana uh, mass term can be written in this way. Okay. So you have here NL conjugate bar, here NL. This, this is exactly a, a Majorana mass term. But now in the middle, the mass matrix is uh, this big mass matrix, which is written here. So in the element 1, 1, we have ML, which was the mass matrix for the left-handed Majorana. Here, the right-handed Majorana, and here, the Dirac one. Okay. So next poll. What is the dimension of this matrix? A. B, C, start. People are taking some time to think. So I see that these quizzes are not completely useless. Okay, so let me, I think we have already some, some statistics here. Let me show you the response. So 29 people think that it's A, 12 people B, and two people C. So in fact, the right answer is A. It's a NR plus three times NR plus three matrix. So this means that, for instance, if I add three right-handed neutrino fields in the to the standard model, uh, my mass matrix will be a six by six mass matrix. Okay. So for now, I will not say anything about this ML, MD, and MR. The only thing I will say is that it's a complex symmetric mass matrix. Okay, three plus an R times three plus an R complex symmetric uh, mass matrix. Now, how do I do I diagonalize this thing? I have to diagonalize it because I have to go. This is a general matrix, but it is defined in flavor space, right? Remember that those mass matrices, apart from MR and ML, which have to be uh, complex uh, are in general complex symmetric, they can be anything. Okay, so I will not say anything about them now. I will just say that now this, the, the, the mass eigenstates, I will denote them by n hat L, and I will relate them with the weak states by this transformation, VL nu. And this is a unitary 3 plus nr times 3 plus nr complex matrix. Okay. 
Now, when I diagonalize this matrix, I go, I do the transformation of NL, VL nu NL, but since you can also prove that NL conjugate bar, which is this field combination here, it's equal to minus NL transpose dagger, where C is the charge conjugation matrix, then you can actually see that, they are, that the, the way we diagonalize a, neutri a Majorana and neutrino mass term is different from the way we do it for Dirac uh, particles. Because here you see that you have the, mic the, trans the unitary transformation, the unitary matrix transposed, and on the other side you have the same matrix. Okay, So the transformation is VL nu transposed mass matrix VL nu is equal to diagonal. Okay, And this diagonal here is the diagonal which contains the masses, the physical masses of all uh, these neutrino fields, and, and, uh, of all these uh, neutral particles. So how many do we have? Of course, we have three plus an R. So for now, I will not say anything about these uh, masses. I'm just uh, sticking to the most general case. So if, if we do the same exercise that we did before, like saying that each of these new k's is equal to new k l plus new, new k l conjugate, we can write the Majorana, uh, the, the mass term in this term, uh, in this way, as we did when I first told you about the Majorana neutrino mass term, okay? So actually, the general Dirac Majorana mass term leads to Majorana massive neutrinos. So if you have left-handed fields and right-handed fields, and if you write the most general uh, mass Lagrangian with these fields, you will end up with the conclusion that neutrinos are Majorana particles. If you want to avoid this, you have to forbid some of those terms which are um, in, the, in the original Lagrangian. So just some important remark, these masses have to be positive, okay? because these are physical masses, and VL nu is the unitary matrix which relates NL to the weak states with the mass eigenstates, which are here um, denoted by NL and NL hat. Okay, so let me tell you uh, some things about this uh, big matrix which relates the weak states with the mass eigenstates. So remember that in, in the weak uh, vector which uh, I constructed with the original fields, I had nu e, nu mu, nu tau, and then the conjugates of the new r's that I have introduced. So, and these fields, the original fields, are connected with the mass eigenstates in this way. So you see that if I want to write the active neutrinos, you usually call them active because in the standard model, they actually participate in the weak interactions. So if we want to, to, to express this weak, these active neutrinos in terms of the mass eigenstates, you have to extract the first three lines of this matrix. So the matrix which relates the active neutrinos with all the mass eigenstates is actually a three times n matrix where n is three plus n r. So in the same way, you can say that the sterile states are related with the mass eigenstates by these uh, n r lines of the uh, big matrix, which makes it a n r times n uh, matrix, okay? So remember, the full matrix is unitary, but these rectangular matrices are obviously not unitary. Okay, so now one thing that I uh, haven't I hadn't tell you uh, until now is uh, what about charge leptons? So in general, charge leptons uh, in the standard model are also uh, they uh, are also not in the in the mass eigenstate. So. This, I think you probably have seen during Andrew's lectures, you have to rotate, uh, you need here, you need two rotations, the left-handed and the right-handed one. But actually, uh, since you are only interested in the left-handed part, because only left-handed uh, charge leptons participate in the weak interactions, you only need, you only need the left-handed rotation. 
And for that, you actually need to diagonalize not ML, but ML, ML dagger. So you can show that the Hermitian combination ML times an L dagger actually is diagonalized by uh, this VL uh, L matrix. Okay. So if you want to go to the base to the basis where the charge lattice are diagonal, you have to make some rotation. So this leads me to the next pool, which is let me do it here. Let me see the following. So what is the mixing matrix now appearing in the charge current lepter interactions? And I mean the interactions uh, between uh, charge leptons, uh, neutrino states, and neutrino mass eigenstates. So charge lepton mass eigenstates, neutrino mass eigenstates, and the W boson. Okay. Okay, so I think it's already representative. Here, the majority got it. So it's uh, B, okay? The way to see this is that, well, the only thing that you have to do here is actually to uh, rotate the neutrinos with the VL dagger, and this will only affect this part here of the matrix. So it's a VL dagger times V nu, okay? So if you want to write the uh, unitary uh, matrix, you can, in the charge left and uh, mass basis, the form is uh, this one. So the interesting thing now is to look at the charge current interactions and also to the neutral current interactions, although here I have only written charge current interactions. So the interactions with the W, remember these were the interactions between the charge leptons and the neutrinos. But since here I, I am in the more generalized framework where I can have extra neutral fermions, so actually the mixing matrix which appears here is exactly this one, this one here, okay? Which actually we know it's not unitary, okay? Now, if you do uh, the same thing now for the, the neutral current interactions with the Z boson, you will arrive to a similar conclusion, okay? So what is different here in this framework um, with respect to the one in, in the standard model is that now since you have extra uh, neutrino mass eigens and since some of them are sterile, the charge current interaction do not have that nice property of uh, having unitarity of, of uh, the mixing matrix as it happened and as you have seen, for instance, in the CKM, uh, for the CKM quark mixing matrix, okay? But this is in the general case where you don't say anything about the relative size of the mass matrices that you put into the game from the beginning. Uh, later on, we will see that in well-motivated models where neutrino masses come out to be suppressed as they should, these effects may be very small uh, and small enough to be to be neglected. In some frameworks, yes. In another frameworks, maybe uh, not. Okay. So now that I have uh, uh, told you uh, some uh, uh, the main things about the uh, general um, neutrino mass terms, let me look at the. Uh, let's try to now put the standard model into the game. Why? Because those mass terms that we have written before, they were not invariant, or some of them were not invariant uh, under the, um, the standard model gauge symmetry. So now it's time to start looking uh, at the problem of neutrino masses in the standard model uh, framework or in the framework of extensions of the standard model. So for that, let us uh, uh, look at the, our standard theory in 
a very uh, special way, which is the following. So suppose uh, we already know that we have to extend uh, the standard model in order to accommodate neutrino masses, okay? So now let's suppose that the new ingredients that I have to, to introduce are uh, actually uh, introduced or their, their energy scale, their mass scale is uh, way above the electroweak scale. So when we go down and we study the, uh, the, the standard model or when we are interested in studying processes at low energies, we are actually looking at the standard model in a very special regime. So we are looking at the standard model in with an effective perspective in the sense that I say that my theory, my effective theory is described by the standard model Lagrangian plus some other terms which are oper uh, which are described by operators with dimension uh, larger than four. You know that in the standard model, all terms have uh, dimension four, but now in the effective theory, I'll, I allow to have um, terms of dimension five, six, etc. So if you want an example, remember the Fermi interaction. Fermi interaction was just a contact interaction with uh, four fermions, right? So this is dimension six. We know that in order to make sense, it it must be uh, uh, we must put in the denominator some square of some mass scale, and we know that it it's actually the case. You know that uh, that's actually the Fermi constant. That's why the Fermi constant is has dimensions one over uh, mass squared. And how do you get that? Well, if you think about the diagram where you have uh, neutrino charge left and scattering mediated by a W. If you look at the Feynman diagram, and if you look at like from far, you cannot actually resolve the interaction and you just see a four fermion interaction. And if you want to describe that interaction with the number, that number is actually G square of MW square. So what we want to do here is do that systematically in the standard model and see if there is a way that we can get some uh, glimpse about the origin of neutrino masses. So you see that these operators that I introduce, which have dimension larger than four, must be always uh, uh, be accompanied by a power of a new scale that is actually much higher, that is typically much higher than the, the electroweak scale. So obviously, uh, if you do it for dimension five, you see that you have operators of dimension five and then you have one lambda here. And now you can ask the question, okay, so what, what are the uh, higher dimension operators that, can, that I can construct with the standard model fields and which are invariant under the standard model gauge symmetry? And if you ask that for the lowest dimension possible, which is dimension five, there is a single operator, which is a gauge invariant under the, the SU2 cross U1 and also SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 symmetry. Now, what's special about this operator? The special thing about this operator is that you see it involves two left, the two uh, standard model uh, left and doublets and uh, twice the uh, doublets, the Higgs doublet. So when electroweak symmetry, break, uh, when electroweak symmetry breaking occurs, and we know that that corresponds to the case uh, uh, when the, the vacuum expectation value, when the Higgs, the neutral component of the Higgs doublet acquires a vacuum expectation value, we, you, you can see and you, you can work out the SU2 combinations of these fields. You will see that you will get a combination which is new L conjugate bar phi zero, new L phi zero, new L, uh, new L. So remember new L conjugate bar new L was exactly what appeared in the combination uh, which appeared in the neutrino uh, Majorana mass term. So where do the mass dimensions come? Come from the fab, from the square of the fab of the Higgs that you get from these two uh, insertions of the Higgs doublet here. So effectively, what we write 
usually is that we just represent the, uh, the five dimensional uh, Weinberg operator in this way. So you have L, L, phi, phi, and here you put a box which represents the coupling. And this coupling we know that must be suppressed by uh, a mass scale. So at the end, the neutrino mass matrix will just be some factor which depends which is flavor dependent because these legs here uh, carry different flavor and uh, you have v square over two but don't remember don't forget that this has a mass scale mass scale suppression here so what time is it i think i'm going too slow um, so a rough estimate of this uh, of this mass scale can be obtained in the following way so suppose we want we are interested in neutrino masses of the order of 0.1 electron volts. And let us suppose that these coefficients, which are actually flavor, uh, uh, flavor dependent, of which this effective description doesn't tell anything about them. Okay. So there could be some, this could be small, but let me just uh, uh, assume that they are order one. So this is the scale if we want neutrinos of the order of 0 0.1 electron volt. So this means that the scale would be around 10 to the 14 GeV. Okay. So this means that uh, above or at this scale, we should be able to resolve the new physics that is uh, responsible for these effective neutrino masses. So the problem is that the 10 to the 14 GeV, we will probably never, never reach it. So this is an elegant description, but at the same time, it is telling us that if we use some numbers that we consider to be reasonable, then the scale of, of this new physics must be very high. Is there a hope for uh, these kind of mechanisms to, to generate suppressed neutrino masses without having this scale so high? Well, fortunately, yes. And, uh, later on, I will tell you uh, some things about it. Okay, so what about uh, what happens with lepton mixing in this case? So remember that in this case, I'm in a scenario where effectively I have only three uh, active neutrinos. There is a mass matrix which, which is generated effectively, and actually uh, the, the mixing matrix in this case is just a unitary uh, matrix. Okay, it's just a three by three unitary matrix because I am not considering here any any sterile neutrinos. I'm considering that any effects of the extra things that I must add to uh, generate that effective. Uh, neutrino, uh, that effect in neutrino mass operators do not affect the uh, lepton mixing. And in that case, I can say that this thing is uh, unitary, okay? Now, in this case, the neutral, uh, uh, neutral current interactions with the Z are exactly the same as in the standard model, because now uh, the rotation, the, the transformation which relates the weak eigenstates and the mass eigenstates is unitary, so this remains the same and in the charged uh, current interaction it appears the product the misalignment between the um, the rotate the left-handed rotation of the charge leptons and the rotation of the neutrino mass matrix this mass matrix this effective mass matrix over here so at the end the equivalent of the ckm uh, uh, quark matrix to, uh, for the lepton sector is UL dagger U nu, where UL is the left-handed rotation for charged leptons, and U nu is the unitary matrix with, which diagonalizes this um, uh, Majorana mass matrix, okay? And you have here the corresponding diagrams. Now, remember that in the standard model, this was not possible, okay? Because in the standard model, even if the charged leptons are not in their mass basis, you can go, you can go to the mass basis, and then uh, you can perform the same rotation in the neutrino sector because neutrinos are massless, okay? So in, in the standard model, uh, charge current mixing and also the, the mixing with the Z uh, are trivial. Okay, so how can we parameterize this matrix? There are many parameterizations. I will uh, tell you about 
very briefly the one which is commonly used also because I believe this is the one that Michele Maltoni will use when discussing the fits of the global uh, neutrino data. So I need uh, three rotations because I'm actually now in the scenario of three active neutrinos. So I need three rotations. This probably you have seen already for the CKM matrix, the parameterization is the same. So I need three rotations, one Dirac phase. Then I need to put here some three more phases which we will so see shortly that are unphysical. And then you need some uh, two more phases here on the right. So if you now insert this in the charge current interaction with the W, you have here in the middle this thing. But now you see that you can eliminate these uh, K uh, diagonal phases by rotating the charge left and fields. And you, uh, the, the, the terms that remain are U delta and P alpha. Now, what is important here is that if you were in the case of Dirac neutrinos, you would probably be also be possible to rotate the new L fields in order to eliminate these phases. Why? Because Dirac a neutrino mass term would be new L bar new R, and you can independently rotate the new R to compensate the rotation in new L. Remember that in the Majorana neutrino mass uh, case, you cannot do that because the Majorana neutrino mass is a phase uh, sensitive to these uh, rotations, okay? And this is actually in the essence of the Majorana, uh, the Majorana nature of neutrinos. So at the end, for the Majorana neutrino case, we will have our mixing matrix is the product of U delta times P alpha. P alpha is just a matrix with two diagonal phases and U delta is parameterized in this way and this is the usually called the PDG uh, parameterization. So how many parameters do we have here? We have three mixing angles, three CP violating phases, one Dirac and two Majorana. Okay. Why are they called Majorana? Because if um, we were in the case of Dirac neutrinos, we could eliminate uh, them by rephasing the new R fields. Okay, so in total we have three masses, three mixing angles, and three CP violating phases for Majorana neutrinos, and seven if we were in the Dirac case because of the two extra Majorana phases. So what do we know about these parameters? I will be very brief on this because you will have the lectures uh, by Michele. You can write down the uh, oscillation probabilities. You come out the conclusion that neutrino oscillations are only sensitive to uh, neutrino mass square differences. They do not depend on the Majorana phases. And there are two possible orderings, normal and inverted. You have already heard about this also during Andrea's uh, talks. So regarding all the details about this, stay tuned uh, on the Michele Maltoni's lectures next week. So this is what we know about these parameters. Uh, delta M squares, mixing angles, so delta M squared 2, 1, which is also called solar uh, um, neutrino mass square differences around 7.5, uh, 10 to the minus 5 electro, uh, um, electron volt square. Delta M squared 3, 1, 10 to minus 3 electron volt square. We know very well theta 1, 2, around 30 degrees. Uh, theta two, two three is not so clear. Okay, it's still compatible with forty five at three uh, at three sigma, two point something sigma. Theta one three we are, we already uh, know with a good pre uh, very good precision. We uh, at the beginning when people were uh, started to do these fits, uh, I believe the best fit solution was actually theta one three equal to zero. It was only after a Dyer and Reno results that we got to know that theta 1, 3 is, not, is actually not zero, then the parameter that we know uh, the least is the CP violating phase uh, delta. So the main uh, things that we are not sure about uh, all these uh, things are what is the neutrino mass ordering? Is it normal? Is it inverted? What is the octant of theta 1, 3? Is theta 1, 3 larger or smaller? Here it should be 
smaller than 45 degrees. And what is the value of delta? So about this, I will not say anything else because you will have two lectures about this. And you will know uh, a lot of details about how these things are actually computed. I got. I just want you to appreciate uh, one thing that since you are very young, I think it's interesting just for you to have also an idea about how the field has evolved in 20 years. So these are the plots by the people from Valencia, which show you the, um, the allowed regions for uh, sine square theta 2, 3, delta m square uh, 3, 1. But let me look specially uh, uh, to this one. Now, 20 years ago, Okay, so these are the plots for the for the for the phase. Twenty years ago, the situation was like this. So apart from the quality of the plots, which actually improved a lot, you see that there is a huge difference. Look here, this is a logarithmic scale. I remember that when I started to work on uh, neutrino physics, uh, each time we proposed a model to explain neutrino masses and mixings, we actually had to contemplate all the possible solutions that there were uh, for these allowed regions here in the theta 1, 2, delta m square 2, 1 plane. These were called uh, just so and vacuum solution. These were called small mixing angle solution. This was called large mixing angle solution. I don't remember if there was probably any other uh, name for this. But the important thing is that maybe, OK, you think, well, the regions are not that different, right? They are more or less of the same size. So let me try to superimpose, OK? And I'm already exaggerating a bit on this. So you see the improvement that has been on the experimental side, to which led uh, today to a very good measurement of, uh, of these parameters. Of course, that we want more, and we always want more. But I believe that in the future, we will, uh, we will get what what we want. And for that, uh, as I said again, you will have much more details during uh, Michaela's talks. So what about neutrino masses? Uh, direct measurements, uh, you probably will also hear about this in other lectures. You analyze the endpoint spectrum uh, uh, of, the sp of the beta decay spectrum for tritium. Catherine is telling us that there is a limit on neutrino masses, which is around one electron volt. There is also a very interesting process, which is neutrino unstable beta decay. And here, this one is important because it's a lepton number uh, violating process, just like Majorana masses. So neutrino unstable beta decay must have something to do with Majorana uh, nature of uh, neutrinos. And actually, there is a theorem which says that, OK, so if you actually have some physics which is responsible for neutrino unstable beta decay, then you can use the same physics to give uh, neutrinos a Majorana mass. And this theorem by Shester and uh, José has uh, uh, almost 40 years by them. Okay? So Andreas also told you that uh, the, half, the inverse half time is uh, proportional to this m beta beta squared. And now, depending on whether you are considering normal hierarchy or inverted hierarchy, you can write m2 and m3 as a function of the mass square differences 2, 1, and 3, 1, and a lightest neutrino mass. Or if you are in inverted ordering, you can write m1 and m2 as a function also of m lightest and the same delta m squared. So, M beta beta depends obviously on the masses and mixing angles and the phases. I'm going very fast on this because Andreas already showed you this, uh, these results. And roughly the situation is this one. If you try to uh, plot M beta beta as a function of the lightest uh, neutrino mass, uh, and you leave uh, you, you vary the, the, the other parameters like the mixing angles, the, the delta m squares, and the phases which are, uh, which are uh, unconstrained, and also the phase delta. You get regions which, are, uh, which look like this. You have seen a much more rigorous uh, plot 
uh, in Andrea's paper, and he also explained you that next generation of neutrino stable beta experiments will be able to cover uh, the inverse uh, hierarchy uh, region, and and we will have to wait a bit more to start probing the normal hierarchy. Now, one thing I want to point out, and it is very important, is that this plot is valid only, and this was actually stressed by Andreas, by Andrea. Uh, this plot is valid only if you uh, assume that the only thing I have is the standard model plus Majorana neutrino masses. And this is important to stress because if I had other new kinds of uh, new physics, then there may be extra contributions to neutrino non stable beta decay. And this would probably spoil this, 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 um, this scenario. Okay, I will not have time to go into detail, but you see there are, for, in, for instance, here extra gauge bosons WR, which appear in left right symmetric models, for instance, which are natural extensions of, uh, of the standard model. Now, uh, the data uh, uh, so far is compatible with having one lightest, uh, one, uh, the lightest neutrino with uh, vanishing mass. In this case, actually, you can plot m beta beta as a function of alpha, since in this case, you only have one uh, Majorana phase because the other one can be rephased away because you have one massless neutrino. So here, spoiler alert, I forgot to hide the, the answer, so I will not make this question, sorry. It was very, actually, this, this was a very interesting one. Um, from cosmology, you saw that you saw um, um, from Massimiliano's uh, lecture today and also from Martina's uh, lectures, that there is a, a bound on the sum of neutrino masses, which is 0 0.12, uh, around 0 0.1 electron volt. And now my, que my next question was, so suppose that Catherine measures or comes out with the result for a neutrino mass, which is larger than 0 0.2, because the sensitivity is still 0 0.2 electron volts. So what can you say for sure? Is Catherine wrong? Is cosmology wrong? Or these are exciting news? So for me, the right answer is that these are exciting news, OK? Because you clearly see that it seems to be incompatible to have a lightest neutrino mass above 0 0.2 and then having a sum of the neutrino masses, which is less than 0 0.12 EV. Anyways. The limit varies uh, a lot depending on the model you have here, just for your reference uh, from this paper, uh, several uh, limits, uh, considering several assumptions and several models. So I will not go into detail uh, on this because you will see it probably uh, in Massimiliano's lectures. So we have, uh, we saw that how uh, how can an effective neutrino masses arise from arise from the five dimensional operators? So now it's time to see how can we realize this effective neutrino mass operator. So what I want to do now is that I want to extend the standard model with actually having concrete things in such a way that at the effective level I get the uh, Weinberg operator. Okay, so. The question is, how can the standard model be extended such that the five-dimensional operator appear at the effective level? So remember that the typical scale was 10 to the 14 GeV. Okay? So typically, when what people do, not always, but the vanilla, let's say the vanilla scenario, is a scenario where you introduce heavy de degrees of freedom. So you have some standard model fields some, some with some heavy beasts, I put here three types and you will understand why uh, later. And when you go to the limit of low energies, you have the standard model plus effective neutrino masses, and hopefully you will have some other effects, okay? And these some other effects are important because they would allow you to probe, to have an extra probe maybe uh, uh, regarding the physics which is behind uh, the neutrino mass generation. So how do we, actually go from this full theory 
to the uh, effective theory. I go very fast on this. So we have the Lagrangian of the full theory, which depends on the light standard model fields, I will call them light, and the heavy fields that I will add. So this is the standard model Lagrangian plus some other terms which involve not only the heavy fields, but also interactions among the heavy and the light fields. Okay. So in the effective theory, as I told you before, you will have the standard model Lagrangian plus these higher dimensional uh, operator terms. Obviously, and this is the important thing, the full theory, we do not lose uh, uh, the whole information of the full theory. Why? Because in the effective theory that there will be uh, the couplings and the masses of the full theory. Okay. And when we will try, uh, and when we will look when we will look for realizations for the effective dimension five operator, you will see explicitly how it comes up uh, in how it comes into the game. So then you can do something uh, in the following way. So consider the path integral of uh, the effective uh, for the effective action. Okay, and then this uh, effective this path integral for the effective theory is actually obtained by integrating. The, uh, functionally integrating, so you remember this is a functional integration, uh, integrating out the fields from the full uh, theory. Okay. Ob obviously, the full action is nothing but the integral in the four, sp uh, four space time, uh, uh, four space time uh, in uh, integral of the full Lagrangian. So at the end, when you actually do this uh, functional integration, you will get the path integral for the effective theory in a form which is written as exponential of the integral of the standard model Lagrangian plus all the terms that are dimension uh, with dimension higher than four. Okay. If you want to know more details about this, you can uh, look at this uh, paper by Weinberg and also this paper by uh, Bilenki and Arkady who actually uh, have some examples uh, for this. So what happens for the dimension five operator? We have our effective operator, and now we want to look inside this effective operator and see what kinds of new degrees of freedom can I add in such a way that after integrating out these fields, I obtain the uh, uh, dimension five Weinberg operator. OK, and for that, you just need to do some very simple group theory exercise. So remember that the dimension five operator was something like LL phi phi. So phi uh, transforms as a doublet, hypercharge one doublet, LL hypercharge minus one doublet. You have here these auxiliary uh, identities that you will learn. And now I ask you, what is the result? of doing the product of two plus one, that is L, the product of L with uh, phi. Okay, so multiple choice, A, B, and C. So remember, I'm doing the product of two doublets, and each and one doublet has hypercharge one, and the other one has hypercharge minus one. Okay, so people are, are taking a bit longer to answer. Maybe because this is getting too tiring. Okay, so let me show the responses. Most of the people answered uh, A, okay, and it's right, it's A. So when you do the product of a doublet times a doublet, you know this from quantum mechanics, you get a triplet and a singlet, okay? So let me start with the case of a singlet. So what I'm saying is that, okay, so this L and this phi, uh, the product is such that the result is a singlet. And now I put 
this singlet on one side, this singlet on the other side, and I ask, okay, what kind of object should I put there in such a way that this is all invariant under the gauge symmetry? So you soon realize that you must add a singlet and it must be a fermion, okay, neutral fermion. So let me call this new R, okay? So if I add some NR copies of this new R, new degrees of freedom, what I can do is end the standard model and write the kinetic term plus the Yukawa interaction between new R, the lepton doublets, and the Higgs doublet. This is char characterized by this uh, Yukawa coupling matrix. And then you can write, as we saw before, a mass term for the right hand neutrinos. Okay. So the interesting thing here is that MR is not protected by the gauge symmetry. What do I mean with this? I mean that since this mass matrix is not connected with the with the lateral weak symmetry breaking, it can be as large as you want. You can put any number here. And people advocated that actually this um, mass scale should be uh, very large, maybe near the gut scale or even the Planck scale. So now remember, these things are all defined in flavor space, so you have to diagonalize. So th this is a Majorana mass term. You need to define, a, you need a UR transformation. And at the end, MR is diagonalized in this way. So you have here the masses of the, 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 these, heavy, these heavy guys. Now, how much time do I have? I think not much. Now, how do we integrate out these heavy fields? Now, this is uh, a bit more, uh, you need to, to do some a bit more calculations here. So you write, you can define this uh, Majorana mass eigenstate as I showed you before, rewrite the Lagrangian in terms of this mass eigenstate. And now, since we are interested in, um, in the effective theory at the lowest order, I'm not interesting interested in quantum corrections, you can actually use the Lagrange, the other Lagrange equations of motion to uh, write the, the heavy fields in terms of the standard model light fields. So if you do this, this, uh, this is the result of the Euler-Lagrange equations. You see here nj bar and nj. You now insert this in the original Lagrangian so you lose the dependence. You see that the capital N's disappear. You see here the propagator of the heavy fields. You do an expansion of the propagators. And in lowest order, you have this term here. And if you replace in the original Lagrangian, you see something very interesting. You see here new L conjugate bar, phi tilde star, phi tilde dagger, L, L. This is exactly the combinations which were appearing in the Weinberg operator. But now you see that the coefficient is determined in terms of the couplings and the masses that you have in the original theory. Okay. So if you compare now with the general form of the Weinberg operator, your effective neutrino mass matrix is just V squared over 2, Y nu transpose the inverse of Mn. Here, Mn is because I'm working in the basis where the, the right-handed neutrino mass matrix is diagonal. And this is of the order of the coupling Y nu squared V squared over M, where M is the typical scale of these guys here. So if M is much larger than the electroweak scale, you immediately see that neutrino masses are naturally suppressed. Okay, And this is actually the essence of the type one CISO mechanism. So in the type one CISO mechanism, what you do is to add to the standard model right-handed neutrino fields with mass terms, which are uh, typically in living in a mass in the energy scale, which is much, much higher than the electric scale. Uh, Valentina, I think. Yes, it's uh, I, I don't know if you have many we should stop, more no? slides. If you want to stop here, yes. Well, yes, I have. It's, I'm it's a time. It's very... time. <laughs> yes, it's time. It's time. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Maybe we can uh, have uh, some some questions. Ask if uh, people, the students, have some questions. 
Uh, well, first of all, yes. thanks for uh, this uh, very interesting lecture and introduction to neutrino masses and mixings. It was also very nice, the feature of the poles. I think it was, uh -huh. uh, it was cool I, because I it... Was, I thought <laughs> that, uh, I mean, the, these were very easy questions, but I mean, in some of them, I saw that people were divided. So it actually... No, uh, it's actually they are good, good because uh, they highlight like some uh, uh, key yes, points yes, no, in the yes. discussion. So yes, I'm, I'm nice. happy that I did it. Yes. So are there any questions? Okay, so I, I will probably be, a, be available. Okay, so I oh, Omar, I yes. Hi, I have a, I have a question. Uh, it's, uh, very simple, silly thing. You showed an, an equation for the lepton mixing matrix when you asked uh, in the poll about which was the matrix that entered in the interaction. Can you put that equation, please? It's yes. kind of a silly question, but I, I'm uh, taking advantage that I have an expert here. So the question is, here it seems like um, the matrix, let's say, uh, of the product of two matrices that are on option B, the left one diagonalizes one, let's say, the whole matrix, mm -hmm. and the right one diagonalizes the upper part, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the question is, <laughs> the question is, I mean, if I do this in a particular case, will I always get the appropriate lepton mixing matrix? The question is because I think it is not always said, and I'm, but I'm not sure that you need to take into account which phases, let's say, each one of these matrices has an ambiguity in defining the phases. Okay. Each one uh, separately. But first of all, if you do the product, they don't cancel. I mean, it gives you a completely different lepton mixing matrix. This is my belief, and I want to. Um, no, that, that, that is exactly is the case. That is exactly the point here. The point is that you see, I put here an L. So these are all the mass eigenstates that you have here. I mean, you cannot compare this with the case that I discussed after, which was only three by three and everything at the same dimension. Here you have to think that on one side you have three, and the other on the other side you have um, you have n. Okay, so. This is okay. not even unitary, you think, you see, because just just think about what you had originally. Originally, you had E L bar new L W mu minus. And these new L's are the ones which appear in the lepton doublets of the standard model. The point is that now those new L's are no longer uh, a unitary combination of only the three uh, mass eigenstates that we are used to. These are unitary combinations of these n uh, n okay. mass eigenstates. Okay, so okay. there's there's a difference. So the way you parameterize okay. this now, the way you parameterize this now, I mean, this is uh, hell because the dimension uh, uh, the dimension increases, and then you need more rotations, you 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 need more phases. So this was actually we will see in the next lecture that in most in the type 1 CISO mechanism, for instance, you can forget about these non-unitarity effects and everything behaves like we are, we have been always used to, like 3 by 3 unitary matrix and so on. But there are very interesting frameworks where you have to look um, where there may be very important effects that you can actually probe in future experiments like lepton flavor violation, even at accelerators, neutrino stability, beta decay and so on. Okay. So this was a very general discussion. OK, thanks. So any other questions? It seems there are so, no, yeah. not. OK, yeah. so uh, what should I do here? You can shut me up, shut me down. <laughs> no, you, you can just stop uh, sharing the screen. I will stop okay, the recording. So...